Welcome friends, uh, let us continue with the session on uh, cluster analysis. So, uh, in the last session we had discussed uh, the requirement, the need behind uh, cluster analysis and the use of cluster analysis. So, we saw that cluster analysis uh, has got a large application, very large application in almost uh, every field, right. For example, uh, uh, in management, in marketing, uh, for example, we uh, use it for segmenting the market to target uh, the right customers, right. And uh, in, uh, for example, in biology or in uh, uh, other fields, you can use it for classification. So, since uh, ages, classification has been one of the most important uh, research areas for human beings, right. So, uh, in that aspect, if you see, uh, cluster analysis has got a very large application. And nowadays, cluster analysis is being used for other areas also like image processing and all, where uh, uh, people are, uh, we can, you know, uh, we are assembling uh, people or cl uh, creating clusters of people, maybe through certain attributes, certain criteria of the looks or, you know, the shape of the, uh, the, the human face and all. And maybe from that, we can maybe create some kind of behavioral patterns, some kind of uh, you know, we can use them for certain uh, purposes, right? We don't know. We we but uh, for sure we can use it for doing different kinds of analysis and studies, interesting studies. Okay. So while doing this, we had said, ki, how do we find the similarity? So we said that in cluster analysis, we use the distance as a measure instead of the correlation which was used in a factor analysis, right? And when you do a distance, you calculate the distance. So we said there are so many ways of calculating the Euclidean distance, the uh, you know, uh, Manhattan distance and the uh, the Malnobis distance and all, but we are basically generally we are using the uh, Euclidean distance, right? So, so uh, once you do that, how do you? Uh, the next question was, how do you f identify the clusters? So, so when we did this study, we found the initial solutions. If you remember these values, which had come between the the minimum distance uh, 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 which were observed, right? So, then we uh, added the clusters, right, we uh, the observation, the pairs which were uh, clubbed together, right. For example, E and F were clubbed together to form 1. So, here uh, initially there were 7 clusters, now it has reduced to 6 by 1 by 2, 6 clusters, right. Okay. Similarly, then we go on reducing by adding up the closest clusters uh, and forming the Finally, the only one uh, final cluster, which is uh, which is a combination of all the total together A, B, C, D, F, G. Okay, all the variables. Uh, sorry, respondents. So now, after doing this, you need this overall similarity measure. Now, what is this overall similarity measure? The overall similarity measure is nothing but the average within the cluster distance. Now, what do you mean by the average within the cluster distance? How do we measure it? For example, let us look at the first case. If you look at the first case which is uh, when uh, uh, it is 1.414. Now, how you have achieved this 1.414? Now, let us look at this table, right? Now, if you look at this table, E and F, I think the pair was E and F. If you look at the combination, it is 1.414. And the next one, if you see, is 2.192. Now, the question comes to your mind is, how does 2.192 come? So, if you look at E, F, G, so the three variables which are connected are E, F, G. So, you need to take the distance between E and F, one pair, E and G, another pair and F and G. Find the distance between these all of all those three and let us and then take the average. So, for example, uh, E and F, E and F is uh, 1.414, right? So, 1.414 plus uh, e, uh, e and G. So, G and E is 2 right. So, 2, 2 and then plus is uh, uh, f and g. So, f and g and f, g and f is 3.162. So, 3.162. So, when I am adding this 3, I am taking the mean. So, it becomes something like you know uh, uh, 3, uh, 4, 5, 6, 6.4, 6 6.4, 6.5, almost 6.6 .6, let us say almost 6.6 .6 divided by 3. So, something around 2.2, .2, close to 2.2 .2 the value should be there, right. Now, if you look at it, so we have got a value of 
192. Similarly, you can measure uh, for others also. So, you can add up for C, D, E, F, G and then this table you can find out all the values, right. Now, if you look at here in this position, what it says here in steps 1, 2, 3 and 4, right, the overall similarity measure does not change substantially. Now, this is what is basically we find something from an agglomeration schedule we say. So, when you the in the agglomeration process, the, how do you find out the question that was important to you was how do you find the number of clusters because if you say one cluster it does not make you a sense does not make a sense because uh, the entire let us say India becomes one um, uh, single market then a company finds it very 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 tough to uh, exactly uh, position itself or target his customer. Similarly, if every individual becomes a cluster which is 1.2 billion people, then it is also impossible to do something. So, you need a value, sometimes you need to divide the country into s s some clusters, maybe in states, let us say the states, let us say we have 30 states, right. So, the number of states could be uh, the way of understanding a cluster, right. So, at least if a co company wants to get into India, it says, ki, well, I would like to, uh, you know, cater to only three states out of it, maybe the southern states of India, the northern states of India, the eastern states, whatever it is, right. So, by doing that, it becomes simpler for the company to target its uh, customers, okay. So, how, what do you do? In this case, you look at the uh, agglomerative schedule, the values, right. So, it, as it starts, uh, you have the total finally here, which is somewhere uh, around 3.420, right. So, if you look at this, the change, look at the change between the clusters, right. So, this was 3.420, then the other one, it is not visible, 2.8, 2.234, 2.8. 2.234. Now, other values which were above it, there we found that the change was not much, right. So, it was 2.1 only, 2.134. So, the change from this to this is quite minimum. So, when you need to find out how many clusters, the question comes how many clusters, please go to the uh, bottom up approach. So, what you do is, this is let us say the one cluster, right. Now, look at these two. Suppose there is a substantial difference between these two values, the coefficients, then what you can do is you assume ki that means this is good enough to be called another cluster. So, there are two clusters at least. Look at the difference between this and this. If the difference between these two is also sufficiently large, then we say there is a possibility of a third cluster. But now, suppose I am saying that this difference is minimal, is minimal, right, minimum. So, when the difference is minimum, I am saying let us stop. Why? Because now the the behavior between the uh, you know the, the 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 clusters is getting more or less similar. Uh, so they, there is hardly any difference to be found out. So we cannot say ki each, this cluster and that cluster are sufficiently different. So there we stop. So and we say ki these three clusters are sufficiently large and sufficiently different from each other. So, we can say now how many clusters are there in the study? Now, we can say three clusters are there. So, finally, we say there are three clusters and now this is something uh, very interesting. Here, some researcher can uh, argue that I will take uh, only two clusters, why three, right? Well, it is all up to you to decide how many clusters you want to take, but there has to be a sufficient justification or you know uh, backing uh, uh, behind it. Ki why you are taking 2, why you are taking 3, why you want to take 4, anything that you want to take, you have to justify the uh, reason behind it, right. Obviously, if you take too many, it is not wise, if you take too less, it is not uh, serving the purpose, okay. <coughs> So, how many groups? So, therefore, three cluster a solution of step 4 seems the most appropriate for a final cluster solution, right. So, we had this uh, three clusters B, C, D as one group, E, F, G as another group and sorry, A as the only uh, single uh, one, right. This approach is particularly useful in also identifying outliers such as observation A. If you see, now observation A was sufficiently different from the rest, right. Why? Look at the value. It has got a, the lowest value, right, and it was individually unique in itself, right. It depicts the relative size of the varying clusters 
although it becomes unwieldy the when the number of uh, observation increases obviously. So, when the uh, when you are doing a cluster analysis you need to identify how many groups do we form and this is a very useful method. So, hierarchical clustering technique which is the one which you just did there are two basically clustering techniques one called the hierarchical clustering the other is called the non hierarchical clustering but one of them is very popular among it which is called the k means and we will see how that is also used right so graphical portrayals if you can see this is how it looks so a is here b c d is here and the c e f is this here if you take totally this is becoming a single cluster right so this is how it would look like this is something called a dendogram. A dendogram is a tree like structure, it is a tree graph, it is called a tree graph if you can see here tree graph right. So, what it does is basically it, it, it just does a graphical representation of the adding up of the clusters together to form a single uh, final cluster right. So, this is the basic purpose of a uh, dendogram ok. Outliers. Now, in the last session also I had discussed with you about outliers. Now, why are outliers important? outliers are important because any outlier can completely distort the formation of clusters it can disturb the formation of clusters right so outliers should be always remove, uh, removed right if they are present right so uh, but uh, although i have written it is it can be retained also in, a, in the last uh, if you can see they should be retained if only there is a under sampling now if your sample is too less right then you may retain but let me tell you please if there is an outlier you need to remove it the best thing is that because yes sometimes if your sample size is too less anything could look like an outlier a small even change could look like an outlier but if you are if but mostly in almost all the cases outliers are critically problems which can distort the uh, all the values right. So, you should avoid outliers you should remove the outliers the best thing right. So, uh, uh, how you can uh, you know identifying outliers you can do through several methods the stem and leaf uh, method is a graphical method right. You can just find out you know the frequency of the values also and see key whether some value is there which is uh, abnormally high or abnormally low right. So, that also can be a measure uh, there are several ways sample size should be large enough yes. When you are doing a uh, cluster analysis you should ensure the researcher should ensure the sample size is large enough to provide sufficient representation of all the relevant groups of the population that means you are not missing anything right. So, uh, it is a representative of the population the represent the researcher must be confident that the sample or the, the obtained sample is representative of the population ok. Ok. Now, question is when you are having attributes as I said your attributes could be measured in several scales some could be continuous some could be non continuous also categorical also right. So, if I have a condition where my variables are both categorical and continuous then in that case can I use both the attributes for uh, analyzing or interpreting or making a cluster analysis yes you can do it the best way to do it is to standardize the data now when you standardize the data that means what they become more or less all are, are represented on a single platform right. So, the most common standardization is the conversion into the z score z score z score z score my pronunciation always is you know uh, changes from z and z please do not confuse. So, I sometimes say z sometimes z. So, uh, the z score or z score where the mean is equal to 0 and the stand maximum standard deviation of 1 right. So, when you standardize the data so all the data will lie between 0 and 1 all the data will lie between 0 and 1. So, when then it becomes easier maybe you have your your income was in lakhs crores whatever it is millions and your uh, let us say uh, gender was only in male and female, but still when you are bringing all of them into uh, standardizing they are comparable now right. So, that is one of the biggest benefits. So, deriving clusters. So, when you uh, how do you derive the clusters how does a researcher derive the cluster is a very important thing. So, we saw through the hierarchical clustering method through the agglomerative schedule that you are uh, looking at the change in the value and the point at which you find the maximum change you retain that as the number of clusters right. So, 
as I had said hierarchical clustering analysis, so uh, we just uh, discussed about it. So, this is preferred when the size sample size is moderate around 300 to 400 and not exceeding 1000. Now, why is it not uh, preferable for a very large sample size? The question is that the number of iterations that the uh, you know you have to do or the software has to do which you are using is will be very large. Suppose you have uh, only 400 sample the number of combinations or the iterations that will do or the multiple combinations that will happen maybe would be around 1000 10 to 80000 right so if you have around a 500 sample size around one more than 1 lakh so such high number of uh, combinations or iterations that happen uh, is uh, one important thing that is which is uh, you know, the reason why we uh, use hierarchical cluster analysis in a sample size which is moderate or not so large right if it is a large one then it becomes really really hectic and uh, very difficult okay so uh, so, there are two methods in hierarchical clustering as you can see here the agglomerative or divisive right. So, either you uh, take one by one add them uh, club it as we did and bring it to a single cluster or you can do a divisive method where you first form the single cluster and then you start the one which is not related and then you go on dividing it till you find all the uh, variables uh, separately right. So, did you understand it is a bottom up approach now uh, either you come this way or you go from the bottom. So, I have first one cluster then I have two clusters then I have three this is a divisive method ok it is a divisive and in the uh, uh, in the other method we had 7 first then 6 then 5 then 4 till we reached 1 ok. So, this same thing right. <coughs> so, uh, ok divisive also I explained. So, this is how the dendrogram looks like right. So, this is a divisive method. So, divisive method. So, you are and this is the agglomerative method. So, in one place I have shown. Now, how is the distance to how uh, what are the approaches to uh, you know uh, 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 join the clusters or create the combination of the clusters. So, there are several methods. The single linkage method uh, the complete linkage method we let us see uh, all these methods. The first method of combining the clusters is called the single linkage method where what is happening is it takes the two different points of two different clusters which are nearest to each other right. So, it defines the similarity between clusters as the shortest distance from any object in one cluster to another object in the other cluster that means suppose we will find out the distances among all the clusters right all the variables and the one the minimum we will take the minimum right and uh, suppose there are three clusters let us say uh, suppose there are three clusters a b and uh, c for example. Now, all the data are taken all the variable distances are measured right the one which is the minimum that two those two clusters will first be grouped together right. Second is the complete linkage where you take the farthest points right. So, uh, you take the farthest points maximum distance between any two members in the two clusters ok. Average linkage is another method where two clusters the distance is defined as the average distance average distance between all the pairs between all the pairs here we are taking only the single the extreme or the closest in the single linkage and the complete, but here we are taking the average distance between all the pairs of two clusters members right all the uh, uh, members and their average ok. So, again the minimum will be taken centroid method is a uh, method which is also very nice what happens here what is the centroid first it is the mean value of the observations on the variables of the cluster. So, you find a mean value of all the observ uh, the variables the values of the variables and then the this mean of one cluster and the mean of another cluster is the distance is find out found out right and then you find out the uh, the minimum one and then you club them start uh, cl start clubbing them together. So, you take the minimum value as the nodal point here ok. So, the distance between the two cluster equals the distance between the two centroids ok. Ward's method is a also a very popular method highly utilized uh, what it does is basically it is nothing but the sum of squares within the clusters summed over all the variables. Now, what it takes basically the it is nothing but uh, uh, 
the similarity is measured between two clusters. So the two clusters all the variables between the in the two clusters the distances are measured and the they are squared right. So after doing this we take the uh, we find out the value obviously the watts method if you can understand there are a lot of the number of calculations are very high obviously right and one more thing is this is uh, susceptible or very uh, highly uh, you know uh, influenced by outliers. So if you have an outlier it is very dangerous because why the simple reason is you are squaring it. So if you have an uh, suppose the all the variables were between 1 to 5 and suddenly you have a let us say uh, income let us say all the incomes ranged between let us say uh, uh, 1000 to 5000 and suddenly there is one guy who has got a 12000 and the square of 12000 then becomes 144 right. So that becomes too much a uh, difference right. Uh, so hierarchical cluster analysis we have explained right. So how many clusters should be retained we understand this. Then we come to the case of non hierarchical. So, as I explained, in the non hierarchical, the, there is an advantage, everything has an advantage and disadvantage. Now, what is the advantage with the non hierarchical? In the non hierarchical, the advantage is that you have a specific, you specify a cluster seed or a starting point, right. So, once you have a starting point, then you can find out easily which clusters will fall into which groups for example, let us say it does not involve as it says the tree like construction process like you saw in a dendrogram in a hierarchical clustering instead they assign the objects into clusters once the number of clusters is specified that means you take a point ki well I will have three clusters right. So, if I have three clusters then accordingly what I do is I will see ki these clusters will for how will the formation of this clusters happen now. For example, so it says assign each observation to one of the cluster seeds for example, so let us say we have three clusters, three clusters each cluster there is a clusters the, there is a starting point, the starting point of each cluster. Now whatever value that cluster starting point is right from to try to find out the the uh, the variables distance or the uh, the score from that starting point. Now then you start the minimum ones and start clubbing them together. So what it results is automatically the variables for example suppose uh, these are different you know these are the different clusters for example uh, the variables let us say. So let us say I take this is one of my starting point okay this is another starting point. So the let us say the closest one is this one to this so I group them then this is also grouped them. So, this is all in the tick one right. So, let us say this is the crossed one. So, the crossed one this is the crossed one. So, this is the crossed one this is the crossed one. So, basically two clusters are being formed and all these are they are adding up right accordingly. So, now for example this one will it come in the tick or the cross Maybe in the cross as per visual representation. So, what it is doing is it ultimately tells you ki who are the variables which are falling into which cluster okay. So, the k-means method is this method uh, aims to partition n observation into k clusters. So, let us say 1000 observations or 500 observations into let us say 4 or 5 clusters in which each observation belongs to the cluster with the nearest mean. So, it the identifying point was the nearest mean and you started uh, uh, you know connecting to that value and find out the closest ones. K means is so commonly used that this term is sometimes used to refer non hierarchical clustering analysis in general right. So, uh, the whole non cluster uh, non hierarchical clustering which is if you can see algorithm has uh, ca can be uh, is generally spoken as a told as a K means clustering technique okay. Okay. So, the advantages of uh, hierarchical and uh, disadvantages. Now, some of the advantages of hierarchical clustering was it is simple right and uh, uh, it applies to any kind, uh, kind of research question where you want to uh, find a similarity you know uh, between the values or attributes and finally, it is uh, uh, it has an advantage because the entire set of clustering solutions is done in a faster method right this is the advantage. What is the disadvantage of the hierarchical clustering? The disadvantage is that if there is an outlier and you want to delete that each time deleting the problem 
observation or outliers creates a uh, problem to the entire uh, each time you have to uh, run the thing again and find out a new uh, cluster right and this is not applicable to large samples as I because I explained to you why it is not because every time the iteration is again done from the very beginning and it takes too many iterations okay. Advantages of non hierarchical or uh, k means so the advantages are here they are less susceptible to outliers in the data why because uh, we are not squaring it right the distance measure and the inclusion of area element and uh, inappropriate uh, variables why it is happening is that in a non hierarchical it is not a tree like structure right so there is no uh, stepwise approach so rather we have identified some seed points as the identification of the basic starting point right so non hierarchical cl clustering helps you to once you have identified the number then it helps you to identify which variable will fall into or which respondent will fall into which cluster right. non hierarchical clustering analysis can analyze extremely large data sets that is the beautiful thing. So, if you have uh, only let us say 1000 samples then ok fine you uh, uh, are still working with a hierarchical, but suppose you have got too many if you have 10,000 can I do a cluster now yes you can do a cluster analysis and the best way is you were somewhere you have to start with a starting point you have to say ki which are the how many clusters will I need and non hierarchical clustering helps you in that ok. Is there a disadvantage now yes what are disadvantage even a non random starting solution does not guarantee an optimal clustering of observations. So, since you have done it sometimes randomly you have done it. So, uh, so, it creates a problem right. So, it does not guarantee you a very effective solution in many instances the researcher will get a different final solution for each set of specified seed points we will see that is there uh, we can see that so, right. So, how the researcher is going to find the optimum answer is a question that is highly uh, uh, you know effective uh, which is very difficult to answer in case of a non hierarchical clustering. Some other uh, another thing is non hierarchical methods are also not so efficient when large number of potential cluster solutions increase that means, if your cluster solutions uh, number of cluster solutions are large in number then also uh, identifying uh, the optimum the you know the, the, the solution is a difficult thing why because each cluster solution is a separate analysis in contrast to the hierarchical techniques that generate all possible cluster solutions in a single. So, uh, what it does basically uh, non hierarchical versus hierarchical the difference is hierarchical has got some advantage that it is effective <coughs> it is speeder it is faster and you can do it uh, uh, you know you can it gives you a very clear pattern. But it has only one problem that it is does not uh, take into uh, account outliers and uh, does not work well with outliers and it has uh, does not work with large data. On the other hand the non hierarchical is good, but the problem is to identifying the seed points right or the starting uh, identification of the starting points. So, these are some of the basic uh, advantages and disadvantages. So, what is the best method? The best method is to have a club of both right have to club both hierarchical cluster analysis and non hierarchical cluster analysis and do the uh, uh, final cluster analysis right. So, a combination of the uh, methods is first you do a hierarchical clustering. So, when you want to do a cluster analysis first you identify the number of clusters through the hierarchical clustering right. Uh, so, identify the number of clusters and after that use that number of clusters defined by for defining into the k means or the non hierarchical right. So, if you have 3 clusters or 4 clusters that is that starting point you can use it for understanding the behavior and trait of the respondents and then grouping them together ok. <coughs> so, what is the interpretation? The cluster uh, the interpretation is that it involves examining the distinguished characteristics of the clusters profile right and uh, identifies the substantial differences between each cluster. So, cluster 1 is different from cluster 2 now how it is different on what basis it is different that helps uh, that you can explain through the cluster analysis right. Uh, cluster solutions failing to show substantial variation indicate other cluster solutions should be examined ok. Now, suppose you find that two clusters are very similar in nature, but still they are showing two uh, different clusters. In that case you need to be careful that maybe you need to uh, work on it and find some other cluster solutions ok. Uh, 
So, these are some of the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, things which are important. Uh, yes, one more thing is cluster centroid the mean the mean, mean value should be assessed for correspondence with the researchers prior expectations. That means, if your cluster uh, whatever you are getting you should that should be uh, you know uh, uh, that should be uh, coming true with your earlier experience or your uh, practical knowledge. Suppose you are getting a cluster and in which you are getting very strange result then there is something there is something seriously uh, wrong and you need to think about it. So, there has to be some kind of a logical uh, conclusion that can be derived. Okay. How do you validate the cluster now? That is the last question. To validate the cluster, what you can do is you can split the the entire data set into two half, right? So once you have two half, and then you randomly after splitting the file, you run the uh, cluster solutions and check whether there is any difference coming or there is a similarity. If there is a similarity, then we would say that that means there is uh, it is valid. Okay, it is valid. So, uh, we can compare the two cluster solutions for consistency with respect to the number of clusters and the cluster profiles that is one thing. The second thing is the called the criterion or the predictive validity. Now, take one variable which have you have not used for the study or one attribute which you have not used for the study right. Keep that as the basis right and then what you can do is but, but one thing suppose you, you have used uh, you, there is one variable which you have not used in the study, but you know how this variable should be affecting the others, the others uh, variables used in the study. So, that is called a cr criterion of predictive validity. It is achieved by examining differences on the variables not included in the cluster analysis, but for which a theoretical and relevant reason is there in my mind as a researcher. That means, Suppose I have got certain clusters, so all and the I, the coefficients of the clusters are there with me. Now I know which variable uh, is impacting how each cluster. Then suppose there is a third variable which is not used in this cluster analysis, but I know ki how that cluster that uh, thing should be could affect the entire uh, you know uh, let's say the GDP of the country and uh, our uh, study was to find out the clusters on basis of how people would uh, respond to car, uh, a new car right now. The GDP is a variable which can affect, I know how it can affect suppose I have a theoretical, then I should that I should see ki well if suppose the income uh, group is there and how GDP would affect the income group, how GDP would affect the other uh, in the age uh, different age groups right. So, by doing that also we can have a predictive or a criterion validity. So, this is all we do there are uh, something more which uh, also uh, we can discuss maybe some other time. Yeah, how it can you can run it uh, uh, in the uh, uh, SPSS also, but that is not uh, maybe the part of uh, here. The basic understanding you should know is that cluster analysis is a very powerful technique which is used to create clusters and then identify the traits. Even even what you can do is you can identify each and every individual member and say ki he falls into which cluster and when you know the trait of the cluster that means you the marketer for example has an advantage of trying to motivate or uh, try to change the mind of the consumer or the you know the respondent by uh, by rightly understanding to which cluster he belongs to and what is the behavior of that cluster right so these are some of the important utilities of uh, cluster analysis uh, i think we are done with it today so thank you very much for this session